you know, studios somewhere far, far away. by now, George Bush has done an advert for American tourism. Hang on a minute. The President of the United States is doing TV commercials. Hi. When I'm wrestling with a multi-billion pound budget deficit or the problem of future nuclear proliferation, I don't have a lot of time. I just want to wash. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if George Bush can do it. Hello. There's never been a better time to visit Britain. With its many historic buildings, London is a world city that is second to none. Excuse me, mate, you've got any spare change? And don't be put off all the homeless people. I know change, there mate. seems to be. I know there seems to be quite a lot of them. Bollocks, your house has been possessed. Hey, what are you waiting for? An invitation from someone who's not going to be out on his ass in about four weeks' time? <laughs> Come on. Hello, Norma. Hello, I'm Boris Yeltsin. There's never been a better time to visit Russia. In Moscow, we have some of the finest architecture in the world. In St. Petersburg, we have a magnificent collection of post-impressionist art. And in Novizibirsk, we have a scotch egg. Only just passed its sell by date. Hello. There's never been a better time to visit Iraq. We have many thousands of historic buildings, most of them in many thousands of pieces. Oh, oh, oh come on down. See the many large pictures of me. The Iraqi people will give you the friendliest welcome you'll get anywhere, particularly if you are an invading army. Why not visit Iraq? Oh, and P.S., if you could bring some weapons-grade plutonium with you, that would be nice. <laughs> I'm growing my hair at the moment, so I'm trying to look like the lead singer out of Ride. The hair is almost there. All I need to do now is smash my face in with a hammer. <laughs> now, you may hum and work to Mark off of Ride or Tim off the Charlton's, but with this music, though absolutely beautiful, it doesn't make me feel any less alone. I mean, with both Mark and Tim, you wouldn't want to, like, hang out with them, though, would you? All right, Mark, just give us a shout if the brake lights are coming on, Mark, all right? Just, just shout out if the brake lights coming on at all there, Mark. Mark! Mark! <laughs> OK, Tim, you're in goal, and me and Mark will be playing a flat back four, trying to spring the offside trap. If they get through, Tim, remember, come off your line and narrow the angle. OK, Tim, come off your line and narrow the angle. OK, here we go. All right. OK, Mark. All right. All right, to you, Mark. Oh, man on, man on, to me, space, to me. Tim, come out, Tim, Tim. Come off your line and narrow the angle, Tim, Tim. Yes! Yes! Yeah, it's like I'm only able to relate to the interstellar coldness and alienation Robert Smith thinks about through the experience of having watched him. You remember The Cure had that spate of putting out poppy singles because Robert Smith wanted to show his happier side. Yeah, that lasted a long time. That was when they were number one every week. I mean, you may love him, but Robert Smith cannot carry a happy tune.
people a thousand times better than that, and so many bands now that just want us to clap and buy. You know, Blur, Julian Cope, Happy Mondays. Do we believe Sean Ryder was a rent boy? I don't think so, because, I mean, he couldn't have made much money. <laughs> uh, I'll have the one that looks like Peter Beard's lives. <laughs> There's about, I don't know, six million of us watching tonight. I want one of us. I don't care who, just one. To go up to the lead singer of OMD <laughs> and just say this. You can't dance. <laughs> and that's it, just walk away. Sailing <laughs> You look like a geography teacher at a sixth form disco. <laughs> Uh, now, I'm sure you all know the true story of why rugby is called rugby. Uh, it's because it was invented at rugby school in uh, 1823 by a bloke called William Webb Ellis. Now, uh, what happened was that uh, during a game of ordinary football, this bloke at one point picked up the ball and ran with it and put it in the opponent's goal. <laughs> Now, you think about this, you think, well, hang on a minute, it's really, really obvious why rugby school decided that they'd make all the other schools play their new version of this game, right? Because they were obviously crap at football. <laughs> I mean, for heaven's sake, someone picks up the ball, puts it in the opponent's goal. This makes Maradona look like the spirit of fair play, right? <laughs> there were 21 other players on the pitch, what were they doing? Referee, handball! <laughs> Surely, but no, they're all going, I say, William, what a fabulous idea. It's an entirely new sport. Let's play that instead. There's no other sport where you could get away with behaving like that. The World Snooker Final, the Crucible Sheffield, Hendry lines up his final shot. Hang on, I've got a better idea. I can just put the ball in the box. <laughs> yeah, I win, and we'll call it Rugby Snooker. <laughs> Also, the thing I don't understand is that William Webb Ellis picked up a soccer ball, and soccer balls are round, but a rugby ball is oval. <laughs> and that's because that was the shape of William Webb Ellis's head after his teammates had dealt with him. <laughs> the other thing is, right, what about... <laughs> What about the P.E. teacher? Where was he, right? If William Webb Ellis had gone to my school, he would have been sat in after class, writing out a hundred times, I must not invent new major world team games during lessons. <laughs> and also, I have to say that it's really lucky that William Webb Ellis went to a school... <laughs> ...with a nice, sensible name like Rugby. Mitchell will down through, outside to Gosco, Hodgkinson's in the line, head will go in the corner, this is a world-class game of Sutbury College of Further Education. Of course, the, uh, the Rugby World Cup was sponsored by Sony, and they were good sponsors because they weren't too intrusive. It's always bad when a sponsor tries to intrude too much uh, into the sport. There are certain deals that you dread ever being struck, like, for example, the snooker being sponsored by Dulux. You join us at the Crucible, where Dennis Taylor waits for the referee to replace the white with a hint of apricot. <laughs> Taylor has two choices here, red to top pocket, come back for the black. Red to middle pocket, come back for the dusky banana with a hint of avocado. Well, later on at about 12.30, Debbie Greenmarsh will be dropping in for a coffee. But first, as always on Wednesdays, it's time to see what's going on in our gardens with, as ever, Colin Ditchmore. Thank you, Ivan. Well, as you can see from the view outside our window here, it's a bit nippy out. So, if you are trying to grow winter vegetables, such as runner beans, you might find that the odd patch of ground frost is going to make things a bit tricky. Is it? Oh, shit! Oh, no! It's going to be a bit tricky! Oh, no! Damn, it's all spoiled! Piss off! It's going to be a bit tricky! Uh, what, you can, what you can do is put down some salt. This helps to melt the frost, although it can leave the pods a little flaky. Oh, flaky, no! <laughs> One thing that will really help, though, is if you put down a bit of fertiliser early on... Yeah? ...and spread it all over the base evenly... Yeah? Then, like as not, come March, there should be runner beans aplenty. 
My grandmother died tragically when she fell through a trap door and broke her neck. She, she was hung. <laughs> if I was going to be publicly executed, I'd prefer the electric chair because just before they pull the switch, when the priest, or in my case the rabbi, says, have you got any last requests, I can say, yeah, hold my hand. <laughs> I'll tell you what I'd like to see suddenly turn into an electric chair, though. That big chair that Jimmy Savile sits in. <laughs> That'd make him go, ooh. To pronounce the death sentence in the old days, the judge used to have to put a black cloth on his head, on top of the wig. Uh, the temptation must have always been there. Geoffrey Trotman. I sentence you to be taken from this place, and from thence to a place... <laughs> ...of execution, <laughs> where you shall be hung by the neck... <laughs> ...until you be dead. Call Norris McWhorter! Derek Bentley was hung, there was a lot of talk about did he mean give him the gun when he said to Chris Craig, let him have it, or did he mean shoot him? I think Derek Bentley deserves his pardon, because it seems to me like eventually the judge just thought, oh, hang him for using an ambiguous phrase in a critical situation. <laughs> like, OK, Chris, blow him away by the noble gesture of giving him the gun. <laughs> Hello, Derek. I was just wondering, could I borrow your watering can? Certainly, Mr Dalton. Uh, Chris, let him have it. Of give him the watering can. Oh no, I thought you meant in the sense of kill him. Oh, of course, yes, let him have it. Give him the watering can. Kill him. Oh, oh, oh. Um, this is my new dog, Bruno, Mr. Craig. You're right. He doesn't like being held. <laughs> okay, Chris, put him down. <laughs> no, I meant in the sense of put him down on the ground. Okay, Chris, kill the policeman. Shoot him with your gun. <laughs> no! Oh, sorry, I thought you meant in the sense of put a red bucket on your head and do a little dog. <laughs> Tonight we are very privileged to have with us one of the major figures of modern music. A singer-songwriter who can truly be called a superstar, George Michael. <laughs> are a respected composer and songwriter the world over. The platinum-selling Faith album won you a Grammy. While Listen Without Prejudice only served to further confirm your reputation as both artist and producer. So, I'd like to talk about Wake Me Up Before You Go-Go. <laughs> Don't leave me hanging on like a yo-yo. <laughs> yeah, and then there was Club Tropicana drink to free. Fun and sunshine, there's enough for everyone. Yeah, I'd like to talk about my new album. I bet you'd like to talk about your new album, George, but I'd like to talk about the shuttlecock down the shorts. <laughs> Bad boys, stick together. Do, 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 do. Woo, woo! How many Grammys do you win for that, then? It's a common syndrome. The embarrassing early works that you'd rather forget about, but no one will let you. This problem has affected probably every major artist since time began. Ah, Monsieur Monet, this latest work, magnificent. The, the command of technique, the way the light plays upon the field, formidable. Merci. So, I'd like to talk about this. Mais non! <laughs> yes, My Mummy and Daddy's House by Claude Monet, 3C. The 19th century romantic poets produced some of the greatest works of English literature. William Wordsworth, during his time in the Lake District, produced masterpieces like The Prelude and Tintern Abbey. But these pale beside a fragment of a poem written when he was 14. Ode to that girl I really want to get off with. 
150 pages of an A4 pad filled with his feelings for Annie Mevers, a local farmer's daughter who he still fancied his chances with years after she had died of typhoid. <laughs> so, Mr. Mozart, we've talked about your latest opera, but now I'd like to talk about this that you wrote when you were 11, this opera <laughs> in five acts that's rather good. <laughs> and I was just about mastering long division. Right, OK, fair enough. Well, let's talk about this. You wrote this when you were eight years old, as you've rather charmingly and naively entitled it, the minuet and adagio in G-sharp minor for harpsichord and strings. <laughs> Opus 57. Right, OK, fair enough. Well, let's talk about this. Now, you wrote this at the age of six months. Club Tropicana drinks a <laughs> free. People always think, because of my tone of voice, that I'm not being sincere. But I am. It's just the way I sound. She was a lovely woman. We all loved your wife. Oh, yeah, it's a real tragedy that she's dead. I mean, what will we do without her? Dad. <laughs> yes, well, this has been identified as a neurological condition where the patient is unable to prevent his speech patterns from sounding like those of sarcastic phrasing. In the worst case of this here, Ray, if he was struck, say, by a beautiful flower bed, he would want to say, oh, what an absolutely fantastic flower bed that is. But it would always come out as, oh, what an absolutely fantastic flower bed that is. <laughs> and this is to make normal life effectively impossible for Ray. Well, Ray, I fought long and hard for this upstairs, and it's cost me blood. But I'd like to offer you a 60% pay rise. Oh, wow, 60%. Oh, better not tell the others, they'll be really jealous. <laughs> Excuse me while I go out and buy a Rolls Royce. <laughs> well, if that's your attitude, right, you can just clear your desk and get out. Oh, God, no, what a personal disaster. <laughs> oh, my family will be out in the streets. Get out, Ray. Oh, yeah, oh, baby, oh, you're the best. Oh, uh, 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 oh, don't stop. Uh, uh, uh. Oh, damn, what a personal disaster. Having lost his job and his girlfriend, he came to me. Therapy for Ray was a long and painful process, but perhaps the first breakthrough we made was when he at last broke down into tears. Oh, boo-hoo-hoo, -hoo. oh, boo-hoo, I'm so sad. If you could get past his tone of voice, though, Ray was actually one of the most genuine people, almost a naive. He remains, for example, the only person I've ever met who on first introduction said to me, Oh, that's a nice beard. Although, obviously, being Ray, it came out as, Oh, that's a nice beard. You don't think, Dr. Sachs, that on this one occasion, Ray may actually have been taking the piss? <laughs> One of the last things I discovered was that the only things Ray's tone of voice could ever say genuinely would be just those things which anybody else would say sarcastically. That John Sessions is a comic genius. <laughs> I really like Brian Adams. <laughs> There's nothing I like better than a good kick in the testicles, preferably more than just the one. <laughs> but it wasn't long after this that Ray died tragically in a road traffic accident, and I have since learned that perhaps his death could have been avoided. <laughs> oh, ow, ow, ow. Oh, the pain is unbearable. Quick, call me an ambulance before I die. Oh, no. My life has ended and so young. What a personal disaster. <laughs>
Of course, strictly speaking, it's Her Majesty's Armed Forces. The Commander-in-Chief of the British Army is the Queen. A lot of people think this is a purely honorary position, but it isn't true. She worked her way up through the ranks like anyone else. <laughs> The Queen's Regiment is, of course, the Household Cavalry. But what is Household Cavalry? Is it like cavalry that's part of your household? <laughs> cavalry was always a daft idea. It seems so unfair dragging innocent horses into human conflict. Can you join us here in the Crimea for the 2.30 Charge of the Light Brigade Chase? The going's good to firm. Let's have a look at the runners. At number 14, Certain Death, 3 to 1. 22, Horrific Carnage, 10 to 1. 18, Look, No Legs, 14 to 2. 3, Innards Everywhere, 20 to 1. 34, Don't Shoot Me, Shoot the Bloke on My Back, 5 to 2. Number 8, Blinded and Lame, 3 to 2. Number 13, hurry up and invent the tank, you bastards. <laughs> Two to one favorite. 600 ran, three still alive, so that's a slight improvement on last year's Grand National. In the 20th century, of course, the army have realized the vital importance of camouflage. Okay, lads, we're moving out. What sort of territory, sir? Deep woodland. Bit of birch, sir. Hmm, birch is nice, yeah. I think it's sort of a spray effect, sir. What do you think of this? Um, <laughs> One thing proved by war in the Gulf was that modern air warfare is so complex technologically that soon the only sort of people who will be qualified to fly combat aircraft will be the sort of people who were good at maths and physics and knew about computers. The entire air force will consist of school spanners. Roger, Red Leader, height 1500, speed 850. Uh, does anyone ride by a lunch now? <laughs> Well, what do you think? I'm just not sure it really says dense woodland. <laughs> In peacetime, one of the key activities of the army is strike breaking. Whenever there's a public service strike like the dustmen, the government call in the army. Move, move, move! The bing, the bing, go to the bing! Dust would have made less mess than usual. <laughs> oh, no! You've just killed Top Cat. <laughs> well, later on we'll be talking to Kate Omar about still being sexy at 50. But right now I'm joined by presenter of BBC TV's Watch and Wear, Debbie Greenmarsh, who's dropped in for a chat and a cup of coffee. Hello, Debbie. How are you? I'm very well, thanks, Ivan. Although, I did have one of those taxi drivers on the way here who kept on talking the whole journey. <laughs> well, did he? Oh, shit! <laughs> well, the whole journey he couldn't just talk? Oh, no! No! Um, anyway, the new series of Watch and Wear is going very well, and we're very pleased in the first episode... He kept on <laughs> talking! The whole journey he couldn't just read your paper! It's all spoiled now! Piss off! <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be tricky again. <laughs> um, actually, though, I, I prefer that when they don't say anything. What? Yes, and one or two things he said were really quite interesting. Yeah? Yes, um, all in all, it was quite an enjoyable ride. Yes! <laughs> it's OK! <laughs> Debbie had a good journey and now she's OK! <laughs> I'd rather be anyone in the world than M. Khan. Now, you might not know who M. Khan is, but there is a railway bridge that crosses the North Circular Road in London. And on that bridge, someone has written in huge white letters the words, M. Khan is bent. <laughs> now, I estimate that an average of 300,000 cars carrying, say, 2.7 people pass under that bridge every week. Which means, whether it means crooked or gay or whatever, over the course of the last 10 years, the fact of M. Khan's bentness has been impressed on over 279,000 billion people. I can't
can't believe anyone's ever given him a job. <laughs> Name? M. Khan. Cheerio. <laughs> the urban planners, they know they've wrecked the city, so they try and paste in the odd nice bit, like, you know, a bit of green on a traffic island. Like, you're going to think, oh, hello, it's a bit of the country. <laughs> Better get off this person's land. Whenever I need to get away from the city, I come here to this spot which has mercifully resisted the onslaught of planners and developers to be alone with my thoughts. <laughs> Next week's highway comes from a bit of mud around a clock in Stevenage Town Centre. <laughs> so I've been reading this book called Graffiti by Nigel Reese, which is a collection of witty graffiti collated from public toilets up and down the country, and it's full of very witty things. Uh, smile, you're on Beatles about, which is uh, very funny, a uh, ha ha ha. Um, but what concerns me is that in four of these books, Nigel seems to have missed out every public toilet that I've ever sat down in. Or all that's written on the walls is things like, Here's my big knob! Or, up the bump, phone 365, 572. Or, I was molested in this toilet when I was 12 by two men. They hurt me, but I liked it and came back three times in half an hour. <laughs> or some other Morrissey lyric. <laughs> Actually, I live in a place populated by me and some tramps, right? And they're fine on the whole, although they sometimes do get out of order. Like, once I was playing tennis, and for the whole game, there was a tramp standing about ten yards behind me shouting, You've got no bollocks! You've got no bollocks! And after a while, I started thinking, perhaps he's right. Perhaps he knows something I don't. But then I turned around and saw him, and was just moved to say, Excuse me, but I do have bollocks, actually. It's just I choose to wear mine inside my trousers. <laughs> I was very, very pleased that Boris Becker didn't win Wimbledon this year because, you know, he's after all half man, half pig. <laughs> Where are your eyelashes, Boris? In some sausages. It's getting so bad, I can't watch Crime Stoppers anymore because it just makes me too paranoid forever. I watch that show and have to walk on my own late at night anyway. And so, I don't know, I'm walking up Kilburn High Road towards Wilsdon Lane. I can just hear the same voice in my head. The unfortunate young man has just reached the junction of Kilburn High Road and Wilsdon Lane. And that's when I think, damn, if I wasn't so lonely, if I wasn't on my own all the time, if I had some friends, then I wouldn't have this fear. Because then, then it'd be like, all right, okay, <laughs> you've pulled a blade, all right. But there's one of you and two of us. Right, Mark? <laughs> Get home! Down the hill, there's a theme pub. The theme is stabbing. Do you remember that time about two years ago when everyone was packing a knife or like pretending to? Every time you got into an argument with some guy, he'd be like, and you'd be like that as well. And eventually you both backed down, suddenly aware of what you were doing. Here you are actually contemplating inflicting a possibly fatal injury on another human being using a bus pass. <laughs> so I took full advantage of that one day travel card amnesty when it came. I don't know, everything in this town's all broken, it's all spoilt. Only a miracle can save us. We are Galaxian troubleshooters who turn Saturn's poisonous rings to rainbows, who sit in vigil by dying stars, who in the blast of Big Bang transcended hates to live forever in pure love, who now come down to help you here. What is your name? M. Khan. <laughs> Mm-hmm.